with what passion and erudition those lectures will be delivered. Um, Leslie has been teaching English and film at UCT since the 1980s um, and was an early winner of the Distinguished Teacher Award. She was the inaugural director and founder of the Center for Film and Media Studies. She has teaching and research interests in American literature, comparative studies, and most important for this week's lectures, film adaptation. Thank you, Leslie, for coming again. <laughs> Thanks, Nula. Um, so what I've got here is um, a mix of images. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Um, a mix of images, PowerPoint images, and clips from some films that I think you might enjoy watching that represent Venice in interesting ways. And so what I'll be doing is moving between the clips and then find uh, and the and the images. So. Um, I do know what I'm doing. I'm not actually faffing around, but it is a process. So here I have this rather lovely opening image, um, imagining Venice in film and literature, and the images are obviously Turner paintings, the Rialto in the moonlight, and the Bridge of Sighs, and I'll be talking a little bit more about those in a moment. Um, this is the poem by Samuel Rogers, and Turner was first invited to illustrate Samuel Rogers' poems, although Turner's reputation has lasted. Who knows about Samuel Rogers? Peter Anderson probably does, but I don't think anyone else does. But he wrote these poems about Venice, and this is how uh, John Julius Norwich starts his famous book on the history of Venice, Rogers talking about the founding of Venice. A few in fear, flying away from from him whose boast it was that the grass grew not where his horse had trod, gave birth to Venice. Like the waterfowl, they built their nests among the ocean waves. And where the sands were shifting as the wind blew from the north or south, where, that, where they that came had to make sure the ground they stood upon rose, like an exhalation from the deep. A vast metropolis with glistening spires, with theatres, basilicas adorned, a scene of light and glory, a dominion that has endured the longest among men. And I think what we get here is the sense of the miraculousness of Venice. How on earth was it possible for them to, to build the city with its gleaming spires, for the city to rise out of the deeps? I am getting tears in my eyes. Do you have a tissue? You don't come with tissues. That's very bad. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try not to let it get too much. So a rather wonderful incantation to this miracle of Venice, and I will talk a little bit about the history of Venice. Um, here, a very famous map. Uh, thank you. Winnie, my darling, thank you so much. Um, it's, um, it's a rather wonderful map, which you will see represented in quite a lot of films. You see it in the background, for example, in Don't Look Now, but I thought it, it's rather beautiful um, because the shape is so lovely. It's, it's very shapely, it's, uh, and it's got this wonderful fluid sense of the canals working their way through the streets. Um, and later on in today's lecture, I'll be talking about how often Venice has been construed as feminine. So we'll go on to that in a moment. Um, the history book from which I'm drawing a great deal is by John. John Julius Norwich called A History of Venice came out in a single volume in 1983 and um, he has this wonderful moment right at the start of his, um, of his book where he talks about what a strange landscape Venice provides us with. It is a curious world, this world of the Venetian lagoon, some 200 square miles of salt water, much of it shallow enough for a man to wade through waist deep but, and this is where the crux comes, 
crisscrossed with deeper channels along which Venetian shipping has for centuries made its way to the open sea, studded with shoals formed by the silt of the Brenta, Sile, and other grander streams like the Po and the Adige that have come down from the Alps. So it's a very complex watery landscape and only if you know where the deeps are and where the shallows are and where the silt is can you navigate that lagoon, which is why Venice was so protected from insurgents, from attacks, from aggression of the empires that surrounded her. So the story goes that the original Venetians were refugees who fled from the Goths under Alaric and the Huns under Attila. And legend says that it was founded at the stroke of noon on the 25th of March, 421. Um, Norwich points out that the history of, of Venice is so filled with legend, you're often a hard put to, to decide what is fact and what is myth. Um, but certainly in 466, the first meeting was held at Grado to form the start of a self-governing system that would come to define what came to be known as La Serenissima, the very serene republic of Venice. Um, there's a legend, too, that the actual word, uh, the name Venice, and it's a legend, but it was coined in the 16th century. Veni etiam, it means come again and again, for however oft you come, you will always see new things and new beauties. Now tomorrow when I talk about Gothic Venice, this notion of coming back, the eternal return to Venice, takes on much more sinister and unnerving qualities. Here, of course, it's an invitation to just keep coming because it's so gorgeous. Um, a key moment is in seven, uh, between 726 uh, and 737. In the space of that time, we have the first doge um, being elected, also Ipato, and effectively in 811, the beginnings of the actual Republic of Venice, called the Pax Nisiphore, which is a pact between Charlemagne of the Franks and the Byzantine emperor, uh, who was Nisiphorus. Uh, and they reached a pact which, which saw Venice being separated from the tumult that was going on on mainland Italy. Venice was a republic. She would be left alone uh, to ply her marvelous trade across the sea. So that's a little bit of the history. And leave just a few maps to illustrate um, some of these points. So that's where Grado is. You can see it's just north of Venice uh, on, the, uh, on the mainland. And you can see how extraordinarily well situated Venice is here at the midpoint between the east and the west. And the point has been made so often. You can see it in her architecture, in the paintings, this impact of the Orient on so much of the design, so much of the imagination of, uh, of Venice. But she also more and more becomes embroiled in what is happening in the Western empires. Um, this is a map of how far the Byzantian Empire extended. That's the this section over here. Uh, so that was at the height of its power in 1025. Uh, and then, of course, we get the overthrow of the Byzantian Empire by the Ottoman Empire. And there co continues after 1400 endless struggle and negotiation and battle with the Turks. Um, the, um, the last a few images here is just to, to concretize how Venice is so cosseted within the lagoon. As long as they could keep people from transgressing across the Lido, they would be safe. So the Lido was very, very important as a kind of barricade against incursions. Um, and if people bridged that, it became a source of immense terror. And then this final map, just the way in which Venice develops with its different uh, sections, it's different regions, uh, which are going to become increasingly important. Dorsodura is very important because it's where the hardest ground is, so building will happen there uh, in very interesting ways. Uh, San Marco, of course, is where the piazza is. Canareggio is where the Jewish ghetto, the very first ghetto in history, was established. Castello, the Arsenale, from which we get the term arsenal, was built uh, there. So that's uh, hopefully quite interesting. So what we have then is the beginnings of the building of Venice. And this is um, really interesting because um, my mom said to me, but how did they build all that stuff if it was all swamps? 
and Norwich tells me how they did it. They found stone was far too... I can actually read with it. So would you prefer to have the lights off or on? Yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, can, I can read by the light of the screen. <laughs> okay, so uh, what was so interesting was that they found that stone was far too heavy. They had a lot of access to forests along the Dalmatian coast. And so that what they did was to start chopping down trees. And Norwich says that by driving thousands of wooden piles into the ooze, so close that they touched one another, and their sawn-off tops made a virtually a unified solid surface, they could then build on top of that. Um, and this is the, uh, the church of the Santa Maria de Salute. It's on the Dorsoduro, which is already quite a solid piece of ground. But nevertheless, I was fascinated to see the church is built in 1687. And the number of piles they needed to form a foundation to build it, 1,157,627 piles to build that church. So some idea of the effort and the wood that it took to build Venice. Um, in the process of building Venice, of course, one of the major achievements was St. Mark's Basilica, which was cons consecrated in 1094. And there's this wonderful legend that Norwich talks about because in the fire that had just preceded the renovations to the basilica, the body of St. Mark had apparently been lost. Now, the body of St. Mark had originally been stolen from Alexandria by two Venetian sailors because Venice needed a saint. It needed a saint to, to emblematize her power, her standing in the religious world. But they couldn't find the body of St. Mark, and they were busy sanctifying the church when all of a sudden some of the, some of the masonry of one of the transepts fell apart and out popped St. Mark's arm. <laughs> so they were really delighted because there was the body. Who knows if this is true or not, but it's great. I mean, it's so full of miracles. Um, and... Um, the, the, of course, it is absolutely magnificent. It's gold, the presence of gold in so many of these uh, Gothic, uh, um, early Gothic buildings is quite remarkable. This is one of the most famous uh, um, altarpieces, the Palo d'Oro, very much an example of Byzantine, Byzantine art with images from the life of St. Mark. Fortunately, Napoleon and his troops left it alone because they thought it was just made of some sort of plate. It's, it's real gold. So that was one of the things that he didn't haul off back to Paris to portray in the Louvre or wherever. Um, and then, of course, another great legendary uh, figure is the figure of the winged lion, again, very much associated with St. Mark. And here the story goes that St. Mark was traveling through Europe, and when he got near Venice, an angel intercepted him. And the angel said to him, there's the Latin translated, May peace be with you, Mark, my evangelist. Here your body will rest. And the winged lion has always been associated with that particular um, saint. So that's why we have winged lions all over Venice. And um, also it was a reason why the Venetians thought they were entirely justified in stealing his body from Alexandria. Um, the final image of the great symbolic animals is this uh, the, f the famous four horses um, of, the, of the Basilica, the four horses of Venice. They are made of Roman bronze, but the story behind them is really quite alarming, unsettling, uh, and also quite extraordinary. Um, the, they were stolen, they were taken away from Constantinople during the sack of Constantinople, during the abysmal Fourth Crusade, which happened in the early 13th century. Uh, and Norwich points out that the Fourth Crusade was an absolute shambles. It should never have happened. They were supposed to get together under the orders of the Pope to go and rescue Jerusalem from the Muslims. Instead, they ended up in Constantinople and absolutely wrecked it. They couldn't believe the magnificence of Constantinople. And these were forces partly managed by the Venetians. So there's this horrible irony that the Venetians themselves were responsible for some of the most terrible depredations that saw the beginning of the end of the Byzantine Empire. One of the depredations was the theft of 
of the four horses which had been located in Constantinople. So there they are. Those are, in fact, copies because for preservation reasons, the real horses are kept in a crypt. But what's interesting is that, again, Napoleon, when he came in and conquered Venice, he stole the four horses and took them off to Paris to show them off. Well, when he got sent off to St. Helena, the Venetians got the horses back. But they are, again, quite magnificent. And another instance of the way in which Venice started building itself around these magnificent symbols. Uh, there is um, Enrico's, um, Enrico Dandolo's tomb, which is actually in the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Um, he's not buried there, but that's where he's, he's... He was fascinating. He became Doge in, at the age of about 85. People lived that long, and he actually led the fray into Constantinople. He was blind, but age 90 and blind, he still led the attack on Constantinople and inspired people with his courage and his, his war canniness. So there he is. Um, another interesting area of, of uh, Venice that I mentioned earlier is in the Canareggio, which is where the, um, the ghetto is. And... Um, by the 13th century, the Jewish population in Venice was already quite significant, most of them living on the island of Spinalunga. But because the Jewish population was quite great, um, they actually changed the name to what we know it as today, which is the Judeca. Um, they were allowed to come and stay in Venice as long as they stuck to money lending and medicine. Um, and they had a fairly free time, fairly, but as um, the economy became increasingly complex in Venice and people started getting themselves more and more in hock to the Jewish moneylenders, there was a very conservative reaction against them in the late 14th century. Um, at that point, it was really interesting given what happened in Nazi Germany. The Jews were then obliged to wear a yellow circle on the breast, later a yellow cap, later still tall hats of prescribed colours. They were not allowed to own property and they were not allowed, and given how important Jews have always regarded education as being, they were not allowed to run their own schools. So in this sense, Napoleon's conquest was seen as quite a good thing because he challenged all this. He actually gave Jews a great deal of freedom. He stopped the rule by which Jews had to stay in the ghetto overnight. The gates would be locked uh, and they couldn't come out until the morning. He broke that down. He, he called an end to that. So when he marched into Venice, the Jews were really quite, uh, quite pleased with him. And I thought that, hmm? Is that a question? Who was it? Napoleon, Napoleon of all people, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, these are images of the, uh, of, the, of the Venice ghetto, and they're quite important for when we look at Senso on Wednesday because Visconti used that as a very significant location uh, for his film, and it has an enormous impact on the sequence. We'll watch that. Um, of course, Shakespeare was very interested in this period of uh, Venetian history, and I thought those were three quite interesting images um, of the relationship between um, Shylock and Jessica, his daughter. The Maurice Gottlieb one from the middle of the 19th century suggests a much more tender relationship between them. This later one, 1910, is pre-Raphaelite. The dynamic between them is very, very different. The film that was made with Al Pacino playing Shylock um, is a mixed, ver I, I'm, I have mixed feelings about it, but one of the haunting things about this film is that, of course, he has to convert to Christianity at the end of the play. Um, and as we watch it today, it looks like extreme racism. Um, and the way in which the film hammers that home is that he's, his, uh, his hat gets swept off his head, and at the end, he's actually locked out of the ghetto. So he's a man with no space at all, neither the ghetto space nor does he belong in the Venetian Republic. And it's a very, very heartbreaking scene. So these are, are quite interesting moments. Um, I was particularly pleased to find, um, to find this clip. Uh, poor Orson Welles. We'll meet Orson Welles a bit later as well. But Orson Welles was um, 
terribly cute. Look to my house. Can you hear? Mm -hmm. it because it's very very soft and it's one of the problems we found when we were testing the venue the sound isn't always great so often it's a good thing to just to look at the way in which it's been visualized Wells tried to make a shortened version of the Merchant of Venice for television um, and ran out of money Orson Wells was always running out of money um, and so this is actually just a clip from a documentary on the making and there are some rather wonderful images of him firstly that scene between him and Jessica is very very tender and then lock up my doors television adaptation of the play. The financing was all set. So he just tells you what I just told you, but I thought those images were really very interesting because he brings the maskers into play um, and suggests the kind of strangeness of, uh, of Venice. Um, what I want to move on to now is the ways in which Venice has been imagined. And here is Jeanette Winterson talking about Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. Now, those of you who've read uh, The Invisible Cities will know that they're little prose poems where Marco Polo, the narrator, is sitting before Kublai Khan telling him about all the cities in the world that he has seen. There are thin cities and, and fat cities and cities of dream uh, and all sorts of extraordinary metaphorical cities and at one point Kublai Khan says to him but what about this city would you ever would you ever be able to find um, did you ever happen to see a city resembling this one Kubla asked Marco Polo, extending his beringed hand from beneath the silken canopy of the imperial barge to point to the bridges arching over the canals, the princely palaces whose marble doorsteps were immersed in the water, the bustle of light craft zigzagging, driven by long oars, the boats unloading baskets of vegetables at the market squares, the balconies, platforms, domes, campaniles, island gardens, glowing green in the lagoon's grayness. And as the dialogue develops, it, immerse, it emerges that, of course, Marco Polo knows that city. It's Venice. And then he says, but Venice is all the cities that I've described. All the cities I've described are Venice. Um, and so they just become different ways of imagining and understanding Venice. And this is Jeanette Winters's very interesting comment. Venice has not disappeared under the pressure of mass tourism. It has dissolved. It is no longer possible to look at the buildings and see anything of value. Well, we might argue with her about that. The only way to get at Venice is to use the water, its refractions, reflections, the play of light and shadow, and then this is a lovely line, and to recreate Venice where it has always been strongest in the imagination. Venice is a city you must design and build for yourself. The tourist Venice is a chimera, the historical Venice a museum. The living Venice is the one where every canal and palazzo and sunshine square with its iron well and unlisted church has been privately mapped. No one can show you Venice. There is no such place. 
Out of the multiple Venices, none authentic. Only you can find the one that has any value. And of course, as we look, especially tomorrow, don't look now and uh, the comfort of strangers, we'll see how the very labyrinthine nature of Venice's canals means that these characters will find their own Venice. Not always, because these are Gothic narratives uh, in a happy celebratory way. But here are three major figures who uh, imagined Venice in very powerful ways. And we put, you know who they are, Byron. Turner in the self-portrait, and Ruskin in the portrait by John Everett Millet, who then fell in love with Effie Gray, who was married to John Ruskin. So that was the end of that marriage. But Effie had a horrible time with Ruskin. Have you seen that film by um, Emma Thompson? Oh, I mean, poor old Ruskin. He's a bit more sympathetic than the film. It's called Effie Gray. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was an unconsummated marriage. And what's so interesting is how erotic he can be when he's talking about Venice. See, here we have Byron, and going back to that image at the very start, Byron talking about how he stood in Venice on the Bridge of Sighs, a palace and a prison on each hand. I saw from out the wave her structures rise. Often the link between Venice and Venus, Venus coming out of the sea, as from the stroke of the enchanter's wand, a thousand years their cloudy wings expand around me and a dying glory smiles. Or the far times when many a subject land looked to the winged lion's marble piles, where Van Venice sat in state, throned on her hundred isles. He doesn't talk about Venus, he talks about Cybele. She looks a sea Cybele, fresh from the ocean. And so he goes on. But of course, notice here the very important, and such she was. Byron is very aware of the decline of Venice, of the way in which Venice is crumbling, uh, the way in which Venice is a kind of um, alert, an alarm, a warning to Britain, because Albion also is an island surrounded by a sea an island surrounded by water which has protected her, but Albion should beware because look what happened to Venice. So the, the canto is very interesting in those terms. And here again, the, the elegiac quality is very, very strong. We don't have time to read all the way through, but you get the general idea. Um, then we've got, we've got Ruskin who adored Byron's poetry, adored Turner even more, and especially loved uh, Turner's Venetian paintings. Now, I've included this Turner painting of the Campo Santo um, by, by Turner in 1842, um, because it's the painting that Lindsay Stainton is quite sure is the painting to which, um, to which Ruskin is referring when he becomes quite orgasmic about Turner and about Venice. Um, and there's one argument that although he was living in an unconsummated marriage, he wrote to Venice with a passion which betrays more than intellectual interest. Um, his paintings reveal an engagement with the mystery and sensuality of the city. This is him talking about Turner. And his fascination with the tide suggests that the organic... Oh, no, he's not writing this. This is a critic saying that when Ruskin talks about Turner, he is suggesting the organic, pulsing female nature of Venice, uh, which communicated itself uh, through, um, through his work. And um, then this is the very famous passage where he talks about... Um, yeah, where he talks about what Stanton thinks is this painting, the Campo Santo, because earlier than the quotation I'm going to give you, he refers to that double-masted ship, the two white masts that are sailing towards us. Those Asia fathomless depths of crystal mystery on which the swiftness of the poised gondola floats double, its black beak lifted like the crest of a dark ocean bird. Its scarlet draperies flashed from the kindling surface, and its bent oar breaking the radiant water into a dust of gold. Dreamlike and dim, but glorious, the unnumbered palaces lift their shafts out of the hollow sea. Pale ranks of motionless flame, their mighty towers sent up in heaven like tongues of more eager fire. Their grey domes looming vast and dark like eclipsed worlds. Their sculptured arabesques 
and purple marble fading farther and fainter, league beyond league, lost in the light of distance. Detail after detail, thought beyond thought, you find and feel them through the radiant mystery, inexhaustible as indistinct, beautiful, but never all revealed, secret in fullness, confused in symmetry, as nature herself is to the bewildered and foiled glance, giving out of that indistinctness and through that confusion the perpetual newness of the infinite and the beautiful. Yes, Mr. Turner, we are in Venice. And that, of course, is the great orgasmic cry at the end of the, of the passage. But there are all those images of the spires thrusting out and the foiled glance. You want to look and look, but then there are these secrets, these hidden moments that you can't penetrate. So, um, it's, and this is as good a, a painting as any to illustrate that. But what it does suggest is the feminization of Venice, the Venice Venus idea, that description where Ruskin is getting very, very, very excited about this beautiful city. Um, and of course that is dramatized very explicitly in the famous ritual of the marriage to the sea. Apparently the first occasion took place on Ascension Day, 9th of May, 1000 where the Doge Orsiolo, after a triumphant journey down the coast of Dalmatia, initiates the Sposalizio del Mare, the symbolic marriage to the sea. Um, this is a very famous 18th century painting by one of the Vedutisti, who focused on the, the views of Venice, Francesco Guardi. Um, and um, what Norwich says is it started off quite simply as a supplicatory ritual. The doge would be driven, uh, sailed out to the sea, and they would ask the sea always to be calm and peaceful for them. And then the ritual started changing and became more elaborate <coughs> and notably, <coughs> um, they then started throwing a specially designed golden ring into the ocean and hence the marriage to the sea. Um, what was also particularly interesting about the marriage to the sea is how the barge in which the Dorje was rowed became more and more elaborate. And that's probably one of the most elaborate ones that we, that we see there. Um, this is a description of it. It's called the Bucentaur, B-U-C-E-N-T-A-U-R. Um, and um, it, was, it was the most extraordinary piece of, um, of craftsmanship. Um, this is a, a description of it. Um, the scholars believe there were four major barges. The first one built in 1311, the last and most magnificent of the historic Bucentaurs, made its maiden voyage in 1729, which would have been around this time, because this is the 18th century. Um, the reign of the Doge Alvise III, Sebastiano Mocenigo. <laughs> Depicted in paintings by Canaletto and Francesco Guardi, the ship was 35 meters long, more than eight meters high a two-deck floating palace. Its main salon had a seating capacity of 90. The Doge's throne was in the stern and the prow bore a figurehead representing justice with sword and scales. The barge was propelled by 168 oarsmen and another 40 sails were required to man it. Here is Canaletto's version, the barge coming back to the, uh, the ducal palace along the Grand Canal. Um, the ship, and here, oh, here's a wonderful image of the figurehead. Isn't that quite gorgeous? You can see they're holding the, uh, the scales of justice and the sword. So absolutely exquisite. And this is where Napoleon was really vile. Um, he, he wanted to impoverish Venice, so he did steal a lot of stuff. And he also decided that he needed to trash this famous Bucentaur, and he did. They hacked it to pieces and completely destroyed it. So um, Norwich gets very upset about that. He says that's one of the things he didn't need to do. Um, but it was a most wonderful symbolic um, um, barge as well as being a piece of extraordinary craftsmanship. And what I want to do here is play you a clip from a marvelous film by Paul and Pressburger. I don't know if you know the English filmmakers, Paul and Pressburger. 
Does anyone know them? They made a wonderful film called The Tales of Hoffman, based on the stories of E.T.A. Hoffman. And this one, the story is set in Genoa. Oh, I've got to do this a different way. Sorry, this is a... Um, the, st the story, uh, Hoffman's story, is set in Genoa, but what Powell and Pressburger do is uh, move it over to Venice, and you can see how effective that is. Gorgeous. For me. Oh, sorry, they start singing there, but we won't worry about that. Um, the other clip that I want to show you, which is a, of a very different order, but it also depicts this notion that Venice is a place where you will find love. Here it's of a very, very mythical order. The woman is clearly the temptress, the seductress. She is the one who's going to steal the hero's uh, reflection. 
so he's going to lose his reflection, which of course diminishes him in all sorts of ways. And it is a very Hoffman Gothic kind of tale, as we can talk a bit more about that tomorrow. Um, the clip that I want to show you now is much more realistic, but it's also locked into this notion of Venice as a space of great romance. Um, and I watched it for the first time very recently. Oh no, what am I doing here? And was, um, oh, we've gone. Um, where's my helper? Has he gone too? Oh, there I am, there I am. Okay, here we go. So, it's Catherine Hepburn in Summertime. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. it kind of, it's a midway point between Brief Encounter, also directed by David Lean, and the much more grand biopic, epic things that he would make with Gandhi and um, Lawrence of Arabia, films like that. Well, he didn't make Gandhi, but he made Lawrence of Arabia. Um, so, this is a very poignant story about an aging... Catherine Hepburn at her best when she's playing, playing very thin spinsters. Um, and she's older and she goes to Venice. She's saved up really hard. She's a, sa a secretary from Akron, Ohio. Um, and she comes to Venice um, in search of something richer, something more beautiful. She arrives very much as a tourist with her camera. And we'll have a lot more to say about tourism uh, later on, especially with Henry James, who loathed them. Um, but she comes along with her camera. And then, of course, who does she meet? Rosano Brazzi. Well, you see, it's, it's a romance. It doesn't have a happy ending. It has a very touching ending. But and this is off YouTube, so I think it'll sound better. No, what am I doing here? Sorry, it's the wrong one. Um. <coughs> Now, <laughs> what does that mean? The island where the rainbow fell. It's very late. We ought to go. Are you asleep? Fast asleep. You slept all day yesterday. True. You sleep all day and then you don't want to sleep at night. <laughs> you promised to take me to see the lace making and now it's too late. I will take you tomorrow. You promise? No. Now do you promise? Well, that makes it more difficult. If you don't take me, I'll never kiss you again. Yes, you will. Yes, I guess I will. that they're looking towards is, um, is Torcello. You can see the, the Campanile there. Um, 
and that I, I mean the film is very romantic but I think it also has this element of realism in it because um, you have the sense that it's not necessarily going to end happily I mean I went to Burano I didn't meet Brazano Prati. <laughs> I did have a nice lunch and I bought some lace. So this is some values to not meeting Brazano <laughs> Anyway, these, these are films that are very typical of this very romantic vision of what will happen to you in Venice. And it's very different from what we're going to see uh, tomorrow where the dream is there, the ideal is there, the romanticized expectation is there, and then it gets turned on its head in really quite devastating ways. And Venice represents completely other things. Um, finally, um, I know I have to give some time for questions if there are any. I just want to end by talking a little bit more about Orson Welles in Venice. One of the most marvelous films ever made was Orson Welles' version of Othello, which took him three years to make. And there's a wonderful book by Michal McLeamoy, who acted as Iago in the film, um, and had this to say about Orson Welles in his book, Put Money in Thy Purse, because, because that was a big problem. Welles just couldn't find money to make the film in nine months or whatever. He had to keep going off and doing other projects and coming back to completing um, his version of Othello. And this is what Michal McLeamoy says, there is no blotting it out that Orson, be he as changeable as the wind, with all the wind, as elusive as the pimpernel, as unpredictable as fate, as maddening as a mosquito, as movable as a Christian festival, has a knack of finding the perfect place in which to be these things. Um, Wells, it's one of the things we'll find in a lot of these films, how to make the Venice world an integral part of the story, how to embrace that world, to integrate it, to make it uh, part of the drama, part of the unfolding drama, and not turn it into some sort of travel log. Because so often, we'll see it in Wings of the Dove, I think um, Terrell is going to screen that to, for you tomorrow. There are these travel log sequences. Is, Hmm? Do you saw, so did you see the travel log? Lots of travel log. You know, so we, we take our characters, we plonk them in front of various famous landmarks. Not, I think, a very imaginative way of using Venice. Uh, Wells is very different. Here we've got the famous Desdemona's house on the right there, which is the, um, uh, the Palazzo Corsini Fazan. And then the very famous Contarini steps, different Contarini family, um, but this marvelous spiral staircase that he uses. Um, he has uh, the Cardora as the palace in which Othello lives, and the wedding scene takes place in this wonderful small Gothic church called Santa Maria della Miracolo, which is the Santa Maria of the, of the miracles. It's absolutely exquisite. So he's very interested in using these beautiful Gothic spaces for his film, um, but he's also interested in embedding those images in, in the film. Now, again, I think we might have a problem with the, um, with the sound, uh, but the images are what are really important. Yes, it's Shakespeare, very important to hear what he's saying, but for the, the purposes of what I'm doing here, if you could just pay attention um, to, the, uh, to the images, that would be great. And I have to open it like this again. They are just chanting there, so you're not supposed to hear what they're saying. This is right at the beginning of the film. It's the death of Othello. It's very beautifully done. The sequence is also shot in Morocco. He used locations in Western Morocco. They're very, very different from the locations in Venice. in Venice, a Moor, or fellow, who for his merits in the affairs of war was held in great esteem. It happened that he fell in love with a young and noble lady called Desdemona, who, drawn by his virtue, became equally enamored of him. 
So it was that since her father was much opposed to the union of Desdemona with Amour, she fled her house at night, and in secret haste, they were married. Now there was in Othello's company an ensign named Iago, of a very amiable outward appearance, but whose character was extremely treacherous and base. I have told thee often, and I really tell thee again and again. I hate the moor. I'll poison his delight. Iago proclaim him in the streets. Men sense her kinsman, and though he in fertile climate dwell, plague him with flies. No, they come. Oh, what, what will I do? I go to bed and sleep. I will incontinently drown myself. Oh, villainous. What should I do? Do put money in thy purse. Ere I would say I would drug myself for love, I would change my humanity with a baboon. Be a man. Ah, drown thyself, drown cats and blind puppies. It cannot be that Desdemona should long continue her love to the moor, or he to her. This was a violent commencement, and thou shalt see an unsettable sequestration. Fill thy purse with money. When she is sated with his body, she will find the error of her choice. She must have changed, she must. Therefore, make money. Within. I come to ask you this. Is it your pleasure that your daughter be transported with no worse nor better guard but with a name of common hire, a gondolier to the close class of a lascivious moor? This thou should answer. Speak, satisfy yourself that she be in her chamber or your house. Bianca, can I depend on this? Not sure of me, go make money. It is too true an evil. Gone she is. Is there not charms by which the property of youth and maidhood may be abused? Call up all my people! Raise my kindred! There is the war! Keep up your bright sword for the new will run. Soul, thou foul thief! Where hast thou stolen my daughter? Put your hands! Good senor, where would you that I go to answer this, your charge? The prison, at the time of law, at cost of the next session, all thee to answer. Now at the same hour, there came messengers in haste to the Senate. For there was news that the Turkish fleet was moving against the Venetian garrison in Cyprus. The senators, already raised and met, had elected the moor to the command of their troops, and officers were searching the town to apprise Othello of this new honor, when lo, Desdemona's old father himself brings the moor at sword's point to the council chamber upon a charge of working upon Desdemona with unlawful enchantments. She is abused, stolen from me, I corrupted by magic spells. I'm very sorry for it. She in chains of magic were not bound. They were made so tender, fair and happy, would ever have to incur a general mock, run from her father to the sooty bosom of such a thing as that. Orson Welles' daughter thought that he looked terribly handsome in black fess. There'd be, there'd be problems today, I think. Well, there always are problems with Othello. But I think what is wonderful about that, that sequence, and it's just the prologue, after that everything is shot in, um, in Morocco, is how he uses these canted angles. So we never have the view of the Cadora or the, the famous church, which you tend to have in a lot of these other films, including Wings of the Dove. You know, you have the view. You stand in front of it, you look at it, it's on display. Here, it's much more difficult to access the worlds that we're encountering, which, of course, is true of the experience of Othello himself. He's the stranger, he's the outsider. He's trying to understand this labyrinthine space. And so the vision is canted for us as well. There's a kind of distortion there as well. We may recognize the spaces, but they're not handed to us on a platter in the way that so many of these films do. Um, 
So those were just some opening gambits. Um, I was going to end, I think... See if we've got, uh, we've got time here. Um, just the end, the sense of an ending in Venice, which is what we're going to lead into tomorrow with the Gothic sensibility. This is an extraordinary contemporary Venetian painter called Ludovico de Luigi, and John Barron talks about him at length in uh, The City of Falling Angels. And he does these very apocalyptic paintings of Venice. So you, there you've got the, Campa, uh, the Santa Maria de, de la Salute that I talked about earlier. But it's, it's covered in cobwebs. Do you want to switch the light off, Nuna? Thanks. Uh, his version of the Bridge of Sighs, it looks so fra fragile. It looks like something Miss Havisham would have thought of. Um, and he loves these images of St. Mark's Piazza being flooded. Well, of course, this happens in Venice, the Aqua Alta, where the waters rise during the rainy seasons, and people really do have to walk in galoshes and across platforms. But he takes this to an extreme extent. So that is one of his paintings called Impossible Venice. And they are, they're quite spectacular. They're very apocalyptic, and they are dire warnings about the way in which Venice is such a fragile space that has to be cared for. Uh, this is Polaris, which, of course, very, very... Um, aggressive and very phallic penetrating into the square. This one I thought I'd end with because it looks forward to uh, our session on Thomas Mann. He calls this Thomas Mann. And so there are obviously images here that are meant to remind you of the leader. I think probably the, the beach chair, most specifically the four horses that we talked about earlier there in there. You can think about how the symbols are operating here. But again, it's a world that's been flooded. It's a world on the brink of ruin. Um, and uh, he makes a lot of money out of, out of seeing Venice as ruins. But that's another story. I think we've got two or three minutes if there are questions, or we can just pick up tomorrow. Western, Western Morocco, Safi. Yeah. Yes, yeah, 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 most of it. Most, because no, most of, of Athena is where he's at battle with people. So most of um, The final sequence where he murders Desdemona was in fact shot back in Venice. So there's this bizarre thing where it's supposed to be happening out there on the battlefield, but the locations are we're back to the arches and the water and the reflection. So quite an interesting play with location. Yeah. Well, I'm here if you'd like to come and chat with me. <laughs>